Welcome to the Cook the Books podcast by Tea with Coffee Media. I'm Tyler Wachkowski, the president and publisher of Tea with Coffee Media. And I'm Kelsey Ann Lovelady, the vice president of marketing. Back in 2021, we took our experience as independent authors and used it to create a publishing company with our friends. Our mission is to help other indie authors reach more and greater success. This podcast is dedicated to helping authors find the perfect recipe to create their books and their persona as an author. We talk about everything from plotting to character creation to marketing to using your life experiences to create your unique voice and stories. Welcome to the show. Welcome back to the Cook the Books podcast, where you've got your host, me, Tyler Witkowski, the president and publisher of Tea with Coffee Media, and my best friend and VP of marketing, Kelsey and Lovelady. And today we are joined by the one, the only, Matt Gabrielson. Matt, how are you doing? I'm pretty good. How are you guys? Can't complain. Uh, yeah, it's it's been um, quite the the day. I started a. Uh, a new part-time gig um, and had a couple of interviews for uh, some other contracts today. So slowly but steadily picking up contracts for uh, the Witkowski company, which is my uh, marketing agency. So yeah, staying busy, staying busy, but that's a, it's always a good thing. Um, Speaking of staying busy, we've got a lot going on today. Uh, We've got the topic of, uh, Plotting versus pantsing versus planting. You know, we've got Kelsey, who is a straight planter. She's she's a little mix of both. We got me, who's a plotter. And we've got Matt, who is a pantser. So we've got a good mix of everybody. But uh-huh. let's first jump into our hot topic. Kelsey, you actually introduced me to this hot topic. So why don't you uh, tell our listeners what it is? Well, this week's hot topic centers around Scholastic in whom the publishing company who for generations upon generations has gifted young school children from kindergarten into middle school with the Scholastic book fairs. I remember being so excited when the Scholastic book fairs were coming every single year. It was the best time of year. But Scholastic is actually in a little bit of hot water right now because it would seem that they've been offering a censorship option for the schools that they go to. A teacher roughly five months ago brought it to people's attention that when they were getting set up for um, their Scholastic book fair, that's the person they talked to at Scholastic actually asked them questions like, do you want diverse books in the book fair do you want books about BIPOC people racism LGBTQIA plus issues etc and much more recently this September a teacher told us that even though they did opt in for diverse books it took the diverse books three extra days to get to their book fair and a lot of the students at this school were Hispanic and Latinx. So they were missing out on books that might have something to show off who they are as a main character, because she said a lot of the books that were, that had come on time focused on animals and very few had people of color. So Scholastic is in a little bit of hot water for this. Well, Matt, how, how has this decision to separate diverse books um, and to, and, you know, another thing that they're doing, Kelsey, is they're having individual book fairs um, for just diverse books. So how does that impact school libraries and their relationships with Scholastic? Honestly, if, from my opinion and my point of view, I have several friends who are teachers. And this is kind of a topic that's always being talked about simply because, you know, the one thing we all want is the best education for our children, Right. We want our children to be accepting of everybody and treat everybody equally in the same. Well, when you start to take away these books and these readings and limit their exposure, they don't learn. And we're going to start to see that as time goes on. Because like when I was a kid, this is often brought up when we talk about it. It's like, you know, 
when I was in school, we read uh, The Diary of Anne Frank. We, we read To Kill a Mockingbird. And when we were done reading To Kill a Mockingbird, we watched the movie. You won't find that anymore. And I think that's that's something that's kind of lost upon people is that they take the context of the book. For example, To Kill a Mockingbird, they're like, that's purely about racism. But when in all reality, he's trying to teach the kids that, like, look, just because somebody's color of their skin is different, just because X, Y, and Z is different, it doesn't make them a terrible person. What they did makes them a terrible person. And so I kind of think by doing that, we're kind of skewing what they're exposed to. So which in turn, it's like, how are they going to get further examples if we like gatekeep the books? You know, I, I don't, that's the best way I can put it. I just don't think it should. I think some censorship should be done. Obviously you don't want, you know, nude books being thrown around a school, but like, Things that have the potential to educate and have been being used for 20, 30, 40 years now. Come on. Yeah. Clearly, it provides value. To Kill a Mockingbird was, is my favorite book by far. I love Harper Lee. Um, You know, To Kill a Mockingbird was something I grew up on. It was, I love the movie. I've read, I've got every edition of the book. Um, you know, but what kind of Kelsey, what do you think the decision to separate these diverse books, not to the book fairs, but into different orders for the same book fair, how does that impact school libraries? Unfortunately, like it impacts school libraries the same way that the banned books list in general impacts school libraries. The nanosecond that somebody finds something that they think, oh, children shouldn't be hearing about this. Good God, we must protect the children. What somebody think about the children? And then what you're actually doing is you're just saying, I don't want to see anything that's not the perfect picture that I believe that I'm delusional enough to believe in. And I think it because I actually looked up what is the most banned book in the United States. Do you know what it is? 1984 by George Orwell. Seriously? Seriously. Because that is the one that is the biggest threat. If you've read it, which most of us have who have been through high school past a certain point. Right. It's all about the government is trying to control you and the narrative you hear. Which is why the government also wants to ban TikTok because they can't control the narrative on TikTok. It's the same reason why they want to ban books. If you want to know what people are afraid of or what the government is afraid of, read the books they don't want you to read. And yeah, like I like the idea that Scholastic is providing fair book fairs that only feature diverse authors and diverse topic i think that's a very good thing because the breakdown of like how cis straight white authors like dominate almost every single genre worst case scenario we make up 49 percent of a genre that's a lot it's time to listen to other voices and it's time to hear other experiences it's time and we should not be afraid of that Yeah, I agree, actually, because that's one of the things, like, how are you supposed to fully learn if you can't gather every point of view? Now, that's now I'm not saying that, like, one person's point of view is the best over someone else's, but it's the fact of the way I was raised is, look, if you're having a disagreement, you sit down and you listen to every person's opinion and every person's voicing. And then, you know, you get together and you make a decision because if you're missing one person's story, yeah, things are going to look skewed. Or if you, or if you purposely leave that out, it's, it's the, it's a thing of, we need to be able to make our choice own choices, but in order to do that, we need to be well taught and well informed. 
Yeah. To the point. Kelsey, uh, you said that, would you say that 1984 is um, your favorite book that you read in school? I wouldn't say it was my favorite. It's the one that stuck out the most because of what it was about. And I think that was roughly the time where there started to be an evolution from Kelsey just regurgitating everything her parents once said to going, hmm, let us think critically now. Let us have our own thoughts. Yeah. So uh, are you familiar, Matt, with the Brave Book Fairs and Kelsey? Are you familiar with them? I've never heard of them. The only thing I've heard of is Scholastic. That's about the only thing okay. we have around here. So Brave Book Fairs is an organization that was started to be a competition for Scholastic. They have your classic books and they have the ones that are being banned, like, you know, The Chronicles of Narnia, 1984, and To Kill a Mockingbird. They have all those classic books for students to buy. So they're opening up this way to get around Scholastic's book bans because what a lot of people don't realize, you know, I think – especially younger people don't realize that Scholastic is its own organization, that mm -hmm. these schools, if they want to make a difference, have avenues now where they can make school systems. Let me not say schools because the individual schools, I know for a fact, my grandmother was an educator and my mom now works in education. The schools have no power over what they get. They it, that all comes from the school system and your board of commissioners, if yep. or your board of uh, your board of education. So you know you've got to. It's got to start at the top. You've got to advocate for these places. Go to the board meetings for your board of education. Talk about it and you know stand up. Say hey, I want brave book fairs to come in. You know even if you continue to have scholastic, have brave book fairs come in too. Have a, a variety. What's wrong with offering kids more books to buy? There's not a thing that's going to hurt more kid hurt kids from having more books. If anything, you should have one every week. Yeah. So, I, well, sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead, Matt. Go ahead. Well, one thing I've noticed too is I don't know if you guys have really seen this, but like there is a major difference from state to state as well. Because what my state board of education says, uh, Illinois and Wisconsin and Kentucky might be like, nah, no, nah, no, you have to abide by this. You have to use this company. And some states might be like, well, if you want to use this one, you can use this one. If not, use this one. That's what that's one big thing that I've noticed because it's like, yes, you want to go to the meetings and stuff, but like you also need to educate yourself on the state's policies because they're starting to drag their feet into that as well. And so it varies from state to state that I've noticed like their policies regarding you can ban this, you can't ban that, you can have this kind of thing. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so Matt, like, what is the role and impact of organizations like Brave um, in this situation, and how how do you think they're affecting the selection of books available to to students? Well, honestly, it's it's the right thing to do, in my opinion, simply because if you have, you know, let's think about it in terms of a simplified term. Let's think about it and put it in terms of restaurants, right? So if you only have a McDonald's and a Wendy's. But then Burger King comes in and says, hey, we would like to build a store. You have a spot. Okay. Then you now have this third option. It's the same thing with books and book fairs. If you, it's, it's if you give people options, people will take them. And so I think if they're giving the option of like, hey, we also have all of the books, not just this small short list then if people are being educated on the company so they know what's coming in, you'll see they'll be more likely to choose their company because of the fact they're like, look, maybe maybe their parents read this book as a kid and they're like, oh, I miss, you know, picking that book up, you know, at the Scholastic Fair. And then Brave comes along and they're like, yeah, we have that book. Yeah. It's just, it's all about, you know, giving the options, I think. Um, and then just education on the choices like yeah. 
we have to be able to teach the kids, okay, this is what it means when they say they're banning this and just be honest. Cause I gotta be, I gotta, there, I don't really think they're being honest when they ban a book. I simply think it's just because the people who are banning it are afraid. They themselves don't have an open enough mind to, to be secure not, enough. Yeah. They're either not being honest or they heard about one tiny part of the book. Exactly. And they blew it out of proportion. Yeah. And and that's we see that with everything, not just books. So I, I honestly think that's what's going on here. But I mean, I could be wrong. Who knows? I'm just a hick from the Midwest, okay? I, I may I may mm -hmm. not know everything. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. Well, we're coming up to a break. Um, as we get ready for uh our big topic today plotting versus pantsing versus planting it's going to be a knockout round we're going to duke it out to see who is the or what style is the best method for us so everybody stay tuned we'll be right back after this short ad Hey everybody, my name is Tyler Witkowski. I am the publisher and founder of Tea with Coffee Media. I can't believe I did this! I can't believe I did this. I can't believe I did this! <laughs> I am a nine-year Navy vet. <clears throat> the Navy kind of uh, broke me in the process, so I, I am a disabled vet as well. Games like The Sims or Skyrim, making my character and putting them in this world and seeing how they would traverse this stuff. And I, today, am signing a contract with Team with Coffee Media. friends soon you won't have any what are you a fortune cookie welcome back to the cook the books podcast man that sounded just like the first introduction i gotta come up with something new wah, wah, wah. all <laughs> right we had a great hot topic discussion with our guest matt and my best friend kelsey ann lovelady so we're going to dive into our main topic today. Let's talk a little bit about the writing process. So, you know, our main topic is going to be plotting, pantsing, plantsing. But why don't, Matt, why don't you share a little bit with us about your daily writing routine and how it contributes to your overall creative process? Um, I wish I could tell you that there was a routine, to be honest. Ah, but there's ah, not. Ah. Okay. Uh, pretty much, you know, I try, um, most of my writing gets done very, very, very early morning. Um, because it's so quiet, uh, and I, I can't, I won't get distracted by anything. Nobody's moving yet. Um, and so that kind of is, helps me to like, know that like, okay, we got to get some stuff done. So, while it's still quiet and you're distraction free, let's get into it. Um, I usually probably, I, I have only written one novella so far. I'm working on the second one, which is kind of, I've decided that it's going to be, um, the first novella is going to be rolled into the second one to make a complete long book. Um, so I'm really just chipping away and just, I mean, I, I work when I have time, and that that seems to be it. I do so many things in life creatively that I <laughs> I have to fit them all in. So whatever has to be on a deadline comes first, and then what's what time is left is 
spent on writing. <laughs> Fair so. enough. Kelsey, what about you? What do I mean, what does your daily writing routine look like and how does that contribute to like your overall creative process? Wait, you're supposed to have a routine? <laughs> right. Um, I've been trying to get, in all fairness, I've been trying to get you on a routine for like three years. You so. have, you have. No, it's it's just a matter of like trying to find what works for you is the hard part. And I think I'm finally starting to get there because what I found during Camp Nano over the summer is just writing for 30 minutes every single day it's only a little bit of writing but if you're working a full-time day job like most of us are and you've also got other things to take care of just blocking out 30 minutes to write is better than not writing anything at all so and we've talked a little you and i talked about a bit about this over like the last week but as you mentioned i am a planter combination plotter and pantser uh, the way that I like to say it is I have the map and I need the map in order to go on the hiking trail so that I know where I need to end. However, I am not against taking the more scenic route or the shortcuts as required. That's basically how I describe my writing style. And uh, more specifically, like, there are very specific scenes that are just crystal clear in my head from the moment I have an idea for a book. And I'm starting to write those first rather than writing them in order because those are the scenes I'm the most excited about. Might as well get them onto paper and they will inform what else needs to be written in the book. It's called quilting, according to TikTok. <laughs> See, that's that's one thing that I learned from writing this first novella was that, don't get me wrong, I enjoyed the process of getting it all out of my head and kind of writing down the story that I had in mind. But for the second one, I was like, look, man, um, in order to speed up this process, I think we need to at least, at the very least, have some bullet points of things that you know you want in there, and then you just write off of them. Whatever you feel like writing, whatever sounds good that fits the story, but then at least, you know, hey, okay, I wanted to add this in and I wanted this to be the main topic and then go. So it's a little bit more than completely flying by the seat of my pants, but not much. <laughs> so we've heard from a pantser and he basically has no routine. Yeah. We've heard from a planter who is steadily trying to get into a routine. Now let's hear from the plotter because I do have a routine. I I set aside 15 minutes every day, Monday through Friday, to do nothing but write. Whether it's for a blog, for my book, for, you know, the website, copywriting, whatever it is. I set 15 minutes aside every single day just to make sure that I'm writing and keeping those juices flowing. And I think that's one thing that helps me stay on track because if I get kind of knocked off track where – I'm not writing every single day like I was, um, you know, for those 15 minutes, then I'm like, it's like a long term thing. And I get to the point where I just don't write anymore. And it's, it's a bad train to go on. So I try to keep the train on the tracks and go that straight and narrow way and keep my plot. And, but uh, yeah, so I guess, uh, can you explain Matt what it, or, yeah, Matt, what it means to be a pantser. Um, and could you describe your experience as a pantser? I mean, honestly, with this with this first novella, that was my first like real introduction to actually writing. Besides, you know, journaling or writing in high school. I, I just it never really crossed my mind to even write a book. Um, and so I, cause I, by no means consider myself an author. It's just, no. Um, but I was like, if I'm going to do it, I got to do it. However it works for me. And for me with how creative my mind is, if I don't get it out of my head right now, it will either a be gone <laughs> or it will not be the same because then I'll be like, no, 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 that's dumb. 
I'm going to change it. And so I just, man, I just, I just write, honestly, if I have an idea, I just write it. And then I don't be like, oh no, we got to do this, this, and this. I just write to get it out of my head or it'll drive me nuts. So that's probably where it comes from for me because it's the same thing with journaling. Like if I'm having a hard day and I don't write and get it out of my head, it's going to stay in there and fester. So I think that's kind of where I took my writing from when I wrote the, wrote the novella was like, well, you have this idea. You're knowledgeable in the area and the topics and you know facts and the history. Just do it. Um, and also it was kind of, <laughs> it's kind of challenged to do it in a roundabout way. Um, because I had an idea. I was like, I put out a tweet and I said, hey, if I write this, would anybody be interested in reading it? You know, I wasn't asking for anybody's permission. I was just kind of gauging to see like, hey, if I put some time into this, would anybody want to check it out? And I had somebody respond and say, if you have to ask us for permission, you're not a writer and you can't do it. And I was like, <laughs> challenge accepted. <laughs> <laughs> like, don't tell me I can't because I will. Um, Spice. So really, yes. exactly. You know, I was like, why would you even make that comment to somebody? Like, can't you just be supportive? I mean, I wasn't even being like, hey, I need permission. I'm like, would anybody be interested in this topic? Because I know it's not for everybody. Yeah. Um, Kels, so yeah. Kels, can you, uh, you've touched on it a little bit, but can you elaborate on what it means to be a planter? And like, how do you strike that balance between plotting and pantsing? So to be a planter, you do have to be a little bit of a plotter and a little bit of a pantser. It's why you're in the middle. You're Switzerland. You like them both and neither one is your favorite child. You like them both. And you've and, got good cheese. Yes. <laughs> so I guess just the way that like I tried to do both strict plotting and strict pantsing. And some things I can do pantsing, like when we ever write a uh, blog post for In the Pantheon or our old blog, uh, Through the Hidden Veil, that was pretty much exclusively pants. I started with an idea and I just put in 2,000 words. But when it's a book, there has to be a level of planning for me that goes into it, Um which is why I like having the map or the plot so that I know I'm starting here. I need to end here. How I get there, I can get creative. And yeah, I think it's just a case of like be flexible enough to go with changes because changes do happen throughout the writing of the book. Plotters, I have found, I don't know if, I don't, I don't feel like you fit this, Tyler, but plotters I have found say, no, I have to stick to the plan even if I know that I want to add a scene that wasn't a part of the original plan. I have to stick to the original plan. I can't do that. Once I know that my original plan was missing something or had something that was unnecessary, I either have to change course or no writing gets done. It is absolutely necessary that I change my course. Yeah. So... Yeah, I mean, that that's great. And, you know, so that's what it's like to be a pantser. That's what it's like to be a planter. Plotter, like, I take a lot of time whenever I'm planning out my books. I create a, first step is to create a Word doc with all the chapters I'm going to have in there. Um, the chapter titles, basically an outline of the book. I put in details, what I want to include in there. And then as I start writing the book and filling out, I take a summary of each chapter, put it into that Word document so that I can remember what each chapter is about, see where I've started, where I've left off, make sure they're all connected and I'm not missing any plot holes. And then I create a character spreadsheet. The character spreadsheet has things like the character name, what height they are, what weight they are, 
what <laughs> color their eyes, hairs, and beards are. If they have facial hair, if they have piercing, if they have tattoos, what kind of vehicle they drive. I mean, literally, anything you can think of about a person is in there so that I can make sure I'm consistently using, you know, I've had instances where, you know, somebody was driving one car one day and the next day they got into a completely different car. And it's like, oh, gosh, what happened? I mean, you know, not everybody has two cars. And if you don't specify that, then people are going to get confused. So I think just in my head, it helps me stay organized. And I'm a very, very organized person. I've had quite a few jobs where my organization was the reason they hired me. So, you know, it, to me, I'm just very organized. I can't stand. But the crazy thing is, crazy thing is, I pantsed my way through my novella, my first novella. Pant, never plotted a thing. I just wrote whatever came to my mind. And but this time around, whenever I rewrote Not Alone and republished it as a full novel, Not Alone out now, you can get it from Tea with Coffee Media or Amazon. Sorry, we don't have any sponsors, so I got to plug our books. Aimless self promotion. That's right. Indeed. Um, no, but whenever I, I rewrote it, I actually planned it out. I went through and planned out the chapters and what I was going to add. And as I was going through, I added, you know, into this document what scene that I had added it to, what I had added, and just kept myself plotting it. But uh, what role does research play in your writing? Um, and how do you think it influences the authenticity of your writing, Matt? Um, well, I didn't do a ton of research simply because, so I think uh, my book is, uh, titled Small Town Chaos, um, for those who, who haven't got a chance to take a look at it yet. Um, it's really good. <laughs> it's an easy read. It's 57 pages. Right. <laughs> um, but basically I use things that I know. So for those who don't really know me too well, I have a bachelor's in criminal justice and forensic psychology. Um, I've also grew up in a really rural, small town farming community. Um, and so my book is basically from the perspective of a, a, a small town police chief, a crime happens in the farm town. Okay. Are the, the, the small town police department. So they're, you know, they do what they can and they do what they know, but most of them have never been to school. Um, they're simply hired because they know the area, they know the people, and the rest is just taught to them. Um, but yeah, I pretty much just took my education knowledge and my knowledge of farming and rural communities. And, you know, there are a couple things I had to look up. You know, for example, uh, if you've read it, Tyler, you'll notice I mentioned Casey's General Store. Um, I had to look up to see if they were um, around at the time that I have the book set at. Other than that, you know, all of the, the police procedures, the systems that they use, them having to call in the Iowa Department of Criminal Investigations, that's an actual thing. Um, the IDCI is a real, a real agency, um, and it's actually real. Uh, we call them in. Usually it's district attorneys call them in when there's a case that they need to be impartial on and they can't really handle the investigation, whether they don't have the labs or they don't have the expertise, they will come in and do the investigation and take care of it. They have access to all the databases. Um, so I basically used all real agencies, all real systems. Um, and the police department was really just, it was centered around the one where I grew up. The police chief literally drove a Bronco. You know, um, it's, it's simple. I mean, I just, I think that's why it worked for me. I was like, I'm just write what I know. <laughs> it's yeah. really how it happened. Um, mm -hmm. I was like, I have this degree. I used it for a year. Might as well use it for something else. There you go. There <laughs> I'm you paying go. the 40 grand on it. So, I mean, you know, might as well. Kels, what about you? I mean, as a planter, you do you go overboard? Do you do like a regular amount of research? I mean, I know the answer, but why don't you tell our <laughs> listeners? 
Uh, put it to you like this. I literally have a mug in my cupboard that says, pay no attention to my browser history. I'm a writer, not a serial killer. <laughs> because now why do you have that mug? I have that mug because a friend of mine, I was working on my first murder mystery, Permanent Reminders, which we released last year. And as I was having it like beta read by another author, they were like, this is not how police procedure goes. You probably want to talk to a cop. So I was like, okay. I called up my local police department. I had like about an hour to hour and a half interview with this police lieutenant. In the middle of the interview, she stops and goes, you're not a serial killer, right? <laughs> no, I am not. And after a friend of mine heard about this, she got me that mug. So to answer the question in the very long roundabout way, I am very specific with my research. I sometimes go overboard, but I also enjoy doing research because I like learning new things. I have a book idea right now that has forced me to look up um, standard practices that the CIA uses to name its missions and its projects. So... I know some shit about about the government. <laughs> um, Kelsey, what advantages have you found in using the planting method? Um, but at the same time, have you found any drawbacks from that? The benefits that I found is like you're when you plant the way that I do, which is okay, you have the plan, but you're willing to change it at the drop of a dime, you're going to have fewer drafts that you have to try to get through and that you have to try to edit because you don't need, you don't want to have to write a new draft every time you add in a new scene for the book. You'll be there forever and it'll be 10 years before you publish your book. So by being flexible, I feel like I get my writing done faster. On the other hand, until... I recently started writing those pillar scenes that I talked about that are the most important scenes to me that I love the most, that I'm the most excited about. Um, I often struggled to get started with writing because I thought I at least needed to have the full map of the outline done before I even started on, on the Oregon Trail. But now that I'm kind of going away from that, I think I have more options. Matt, what about you? I mean, what advantages and disadvantages if what advantages and disadvantages have you found uh using the panzer method? Um, well, really the biggest one for me was it was it was more of a learning experience. Um, because I didn't even know that all three really existed, to be honest. I was just like, and you'd think I'd know after interviewing like 30 plus authors. Uh, you would think I'd know a little thing or two, but I didn't. Um, I really, the biggest downfall that I found was, yes, I knew the story that I wanted to write, but I found myself trying to go in a million different directions on what kind of things I should put. That's why for the second one, you could, I, I made the bullet points. There was like five bullet points and that's it. It was just basically like, hey, you know, this is the bad guy and this is the group. You know, this is the new officer, so you need to make sure you introduce them. You know, um, this is the trainings and the upgrades and things that you need to cover. Don't care how you do it. You just got to do it. Um, so, honestly, I just came down for me organization. I had to organize myself a bit more. I found that I can still fly by the seat of my pants, but do it well organized, and it makes it a little easier. <laughs> That's, I mean... It's simple for me. You know, I just, I will fail and fail until I find what works. But then when I find what works, watch out. Because <laughs> I'm going to take off. I mean, it's, yeah, it's about all I got. Yeah. I think for me, one of the big advantages is, you know, I think you both kind of touched on this, um, is just being able to know where everything is, know what things are. Um, and being able to keep organized. Uh, one of the big disadvantages of being a plotter is 
it takes me longer to write a book because I go back and read every single chapter so that I can come up with these chapter summaries. And I also do edits while I do that. So, and then after I finish the entire book, I do another round of edits. So I'm really doing, you know, an edit on every single chapter as I go and then an edit on the entire book and then handing it to an editor and then handing it to a line editor. I I'm doing everything I can. Um, you know, and sometimes if I stop read or if I stop writing for an extended period of time, I'll go back and read everything that I've written and also edit as I go. So sometimes each chapter gets edited like four or five times by the time it goes to the actual editor. So I think that's one of the disadvantages. It does take a little bit longer because I am so uh, obsessed with making sure it's all right. But uh uh, last question for y'all here. So what benefit have you enjoyed the most? What is the most enjoyable part about the writing process, Matt? Uh, for me personally, man, it's just to, to be able to let the creativity flow in a different way than I normally do. Um, because I make YouTube videos. I, I do social media work for people. And that's all good, you know, because I get to make my thumbnails and I get to do this kind of thing and create their graphics for them and do that. But writing is a whole different beast. It's a whole different level of creativity that I didn't really realize that I would enjoy until I did. And I was like, I got I got the novella done and I was like, that was miserable. And then I had people start to read it and I was like, Okay, maybe they're onto something. If they like it, then maybe maybe if I do a little bit more work on myself here and learn about this and learn about this and see what happens. Um maybe even yeah, get I mean, published one day. Hey, you never know. I mean, I I kind of cheated, you know, because for editing wise, you're like, yeah, I, I edited mine line for line and chapter. Two. Man, I wrote the thing in a Google Doc. I passed it off to my buddy who used to write and edit for a newspaper, and I said, fix it. <laughs> <laughs> and what you read is what it is. You know, I was like, he's like, do you want chapters? I'm like, nah. Like, it's 57 pages. It doesn't need it. Doesn't need it. So I was just like, you know, maybe next time I should actually, <laughs> I should actually think about that. But I don't know. I just I'm having fun with it. Honestly, I'm never going to I'm never going to make a career out of writing. I'm never probably going to write more than these two things. I'm just enjoying the process. Like I'm enjoying learning. I'm enjoying meeting new people and meeting, you know, new contacts and, and learning their knowledge. And every interview that I do with a new author, I learn something new. And mm -hmm. so for me, it's like. Even if I never write again. I have this knowledge that if somebody makes a post on Twitter and they're like, yeah, I'm really struggling with this. I'll be like, oh yeah, you know, this person told me about this resource that they can go to and that'll help them figure that issue out. I then have that knowledge that I can pass on to somebody else. So at the very least, I'm just helping the indie community a little bit, <laughs> you know, <That's laughs> nothing special. Kelsey, what about you? What What is your favorite part about the writing process and uh, the benefits of the writing process, not necessarily the writing process? My favorite part of the writing process is the beginning when you get the idea because the world is, and it, the, the possibilities are limitless and you feel so invigorated by the idea that you have this idea and it makes you want to work and it makes you excited and it makes you want to be creative. That's my favorite that is a high that no drug can compare to of course that makes it difficult when you like you actually get into the writing process and you're like oh my god this is hard <laughs> it's so hard but <laughs> that's life indeed it is yeah i think uh for me you know you both know me well enough to know that my my biggest thing is making a difference in people's lives, especially whenever it comes to mental health. 
um, with all of my writing, my blog writing, my travel blogging, you know, I, I incorporate mental health into everything, even potent, uh, which Kelsey and I just wrote and just came out a couple of, um, a couple of months ago, we, uh, it had a touch of mental illness in it and everything I do has a touch of mental illness because I want to help people realize that they're not alone and that benefit having people reach out to me and say, Hey, you made me feel 